Here we go. Hey, hey, get back here, Crystal. Ah, oh, you will. Uh, Crystal can be a stuck-up bitch sometimes. At least George is still here. All right, let's do this. Well, to see something akin to Fourth of July fireworks, I went to a matinee showing of Transformers: Dark of the Moon. <sighs> Does any film franchise in recent memory generate more love-hate relationships than this one? For me, this whole series has proven a textbook definition of mixed bag. The first one, ugh, it had a laundry list of problems I could rave about, both as a Transformers product and as a movie in general, but for some reason it stuck in my memory. The second one, I felt the same way, really no better or worse. Had I done vlog reviews back then, both would have gotten sevens from me. So did Michael Bay actually learn something and improve upon the final act? I'd like to think so. Nowadays, it's as American as piping hot apple pie to rip on Michael Bay. But I try to empathize with him. Watching his other movies, Armageddon, Island, he can tell he wants to deliver heady themes in a dramatic, grandiose way. And I do kind of like his filming style. Yet Bay seems like a child's mind stuck in a man's body, having the will to do so, but lacking some of the maturity needed. Did he mature at all for bringing Transformers to a close? In many ways, no. There's still a lot of that unfunny, dipshitty approach to comedy that makes most cringe. That same kind of idiocy that drew a lot of ire in Revenge of the Fallen is present here. But thankfully, no bots hump Rosie Huntington Whiteley's leg, so there's that. And that's a shame, the whole thing about the comedy bogging things down, because that sort of dumbassery bogs down the first two-thirds of the film, where there's actually some pr pretty clever setup involving rev revisionist Cold War-era wackiness. We've already seen this in X-Men First Class, but the spy movie mystique, I dare say, is even more interesting here, for a while at least. Yeah, the plot doesn't make too much sense in the context of the rest of the films, but it does try to tie everything together. The Matrix of Leadership comes into play again. Megatron reveals an ulterior motive for traveling to Earth in the first place. When you stop to think about it, it's like the Decepticons fell back on Plan C for this one. But I like the way the plot unfolded. Instead of Jetfire being a parody of himself, explaining everything halfway into the second movie... Sam Witwicky actually plays a bit of a detective, slowly unraveling everything that leads to the climactic final third of the movie. That works MUCH better! And there's actually some genuine surprises that gave me chills. And unlike when Jazz got ripped in half in the original, when an Autobot goes down here, you genuinely FEEL something! As someone who enjoys the original G1 Transformers, I also like how it felt EFFORT was made to incorporate more elements from the old tune. Some cynics would say stuff like Optimus's death and The Matrix in the second movie were feeble attempts to throw a hardcore fans a bone, but I'd like to think it was a genuine effort. If I say exactly what elements from the original series were used here, I'd give way too much away. But for someone who still remembers the classics, it was a very nice touch. When you see it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. As for the designs of the Transformers, I still think Optimus Prime himself is the only 100% success story, updating him while still holding on to his classic look. But Megatron somehow looks even worse! Now transforming into a rusted-out Mack truck, and I swear, the way a tarp covers his injuries from the last one, remind me of Skeletor, and I'm not a He-Man fan. But it's great to finally see Megatron, Starscream, and Soundwave all together. Plus, since Ravage died, Soundwave now has Laserbeak! <sighs> since a cassette tape is out of the question, Laserbeak becoming some big flat-screen computer monitor somehow works perfectly fine. And his design now strongly resembles a vulture, which I think works to make him even more repugnant. But when did Laserbeak ever talk? <sighs> As for Shockwave... Great design, menacing presence, and you actually see him early on, unlike having to wait eons for recognizable Decepticons to show up in the original. But those borgified versions of Dune Sandworms were a bit ostentatious for me. As for the battle scenes, at long last, it's somewhat possible to tell the difference between the giant alien robots all up in each other's faces. The camera jerkiness felt like it's been toned down. Thank you! But there is some ridiculousness. 
Optimus Prime, the greatest warrior the Autobots have ever known, gets stymied by the cables of a big crane. Ugh. Come on. Another mistake from the other films that was addressed was the overabundance of human characters that served no purpose. Here, it feels that every human involved in the plot is there for a reason. Well, except for Alan Tudyk. But he was Wash and Firefly, so I like knowing he's still getting a paycheck. Plus, he was great in Dodgeball. One last thing about the humans. All the flack about Rosie Huntington Whiteley being a Victoria's Secret model with no acting experience. Well, except for a Victoria's Secret commercial. <sighs> yes, early in the film, the camera zoomed in on her in such ways that made my eyes roll, but made every prepubescent boy just giggle with glee. <sighs> But she must have some talent when her character, lacking any weapons or means of defending herself, gets up in Megatron's face and cuts him down to size, while all he can do is howl impotently because he knows she's right. He needs some talent to make that believable. All in all, it does bring the series to a definite conclusion, and you feel it. It's nowhere near that fuzzy epicness you got from Return of the Jedi, but it did make me feel like the whole love-hate relationship with the live-action Transformers series was somehow worth it. It's the fourth. I'm feeling generous. I'll give Dark of the Moon a 7.5 out of 10.